and you can get that. So I'm going to um, just be ministering out of my notes tonight and out of the, the handbook, the bloodline. So some of you I know have been and some of you have not been to a cleansing. It's inner healing and deliverance is what it is. And it's it's cleaning out that which is unlike the nature of Jesus. It's getting rid of strongholds and oppression and, you know, can be sicknesses. It's anything that's not like Jesus. Amen. And so many different areas because everybody's heart is different. Okay. Everybody is different. Everybody, we've been born into uh, different families, different backgrounds, different experiences that we have come through in life and different doors that we have opened up that, man, we wish we wouldn't open that door and I made that mistake. I wish I wouldn't have done that and all of those things. And so we want to deal with those things that are rooted in us, in our thinking, those things that the enemy has sown in our hearts Maybe things we have done that we haven't forgiven ourselves, all of those things. And we're going to continue uh, to talk about those things that, that on, the, on these three teaching nights. You say, well, why don't you just pray? Why do you got to teach? Because teaching will break up the hard places in your heart. You know, when you teach the word of God and you release the truth, it goes in and it does something because the word is supernatural. And so tonight, that's where we're going. We're going to first go to Jeremiah uh, 29, 11. God is so good, isn't he? Because you got to know that God has a plan for your life, okay? He has a plan and he has a purpose for everybody that is in the earth. Uh-huh. Every single person, you would say, well, you don't know what they've done and you don't know how bad they are. It doesn't matter. Because God has a plan and a purpose. That's why he sent Jesus. And so to redeem us out of the plans of the enemy. To restore us. To heal us. To set us free. Amen. So every single one of us. You know we've all. If we're born again. We've been redeemed. We've been set free. You know and our spirit is one with God. But our mind. You know our emotions. Our will. Our mind. Our heart. Those things God's going to restore on this week. And he's going to put people back together. Amen. He's going to uproot things that we didn't know was even in there. See, God knows the root cause of why we are what we are, why we think the way we think. Come on. Why we have this, these things in our hearts. So first we're going to go to Jeremiah 29, verse 11. It says, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. When he says, Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. He says, you will seek me and find me. He says, when you search for me with all your heart. He said, I will be found by you, declares the Lord. He said, I will restore your fortunes and will gather you from all the nations. From He says, from all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. And so he's talking about, look, before he, you even knew God, he had a plan and a purpose for your life, okay? And so every baby, come on, every baby that is conceived, I don't care if it's conceived before they got married, every baby has a purpose, okay? The, the sin is, is the act of fornication, but the baby is not a sin. Come on now. We need to understand that in church. Sometimes, you know, we got to understand these kind of things because we might have did something wrong, but God cleanses us and he washes us and the baby has a purpose right. or God wouldn't have put life in the baby. Come on now. He breathes life. Life comes from God. According to the Bible, Jesus said, I come to give you life and life more abundantly. So life comes from God. Amen. And so Jeremiah chapter one, it says in verse four. He says, now the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Okay. Now, how did God know me before I was in my mother's womb? <laughs> how did he know me? I wasn't even here yet, but yes, you were. Because it says in Ephesians that we were in, in God. He predestined us as sons. We were in him before the foundation of the world. That means that God thought about us. That God wrote a book about us, according to Psalm 139, that God predestined us to know him. And so on this journey to know God, the enemy is always trying to traffic us. He's always trying to sidetrack us. He's always trying to get us off course somewhere. But the truth is, God has a purpose and a plan for everybody in this room. 
everybody that's alive right now. Even those ones you think can't be saved. Mm, yes, those ones. <laughs> he says, he said, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I have appointed you a prophet to the nations. And then I said, this is God speaking to the prophet Jeremiah. He said, then I said, alas, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak. I am but a youth. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am a youth because everywhere I send you, you shall go. And all that I command you, you shall speak. He said, don't be afraid of them. He says, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. He's still saying that to us today. He's still saying to that to us today because the word of God is living and alive. It's active. So that word, even though it was, it was written all the way back in the Old Testament and all of that, guess what? It still pertains to us today because the Bible says that the word is alive. Amen. And so God sent his son, Jesus, to redeem us back to purpose, back to be uh, connected to the father. Psalm 139. Let's read that, too. Before we get in, this is all part of what God was speaking to me as I got off that airplane. He's like, purpose, purpose. He said, talk to him about those bloodline wars. I'm like, okay, Lord. Thank you, right? So Psalm 139 says in verse 1, oh, Lord, he says, you have searched me and you know me. You know, when I sit down, when I rise up, you understand my thoughts from afar. He says, you scrutinize my path and my lying down. He says, and are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Hmm. So he's intimately acquainted with all of your ways. Okay. He already knows what you're thinking. He already knows what you did and where you're going. He already knows these things. He's intimately acquainted with you. Even before there was a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all. He says, you have enclosed me behind and before you laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. He said, it is too high. I can't even attain it. See, we cannot under understand God by our natural minds. We can't figure that out. We can't figure out how we were in the thought of God before he put us in our mother's womb. We can't understand that God wrote a book about us before we even came to the earth realm. See, that's too much, too much for our thinking. Okay, it's too much, but it's not too much when you have a spirit. See, because the natural man can't understand the things of the spirit. And so people try and figure out God in the natural. And that's why they don't serve him because it's too much because you can't figure out God that way. Amen. And then he says in verse seven, where can I go from your spirit or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to the heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. He said, if I take the wings of the dawn and if I dwell in the remotest parts of the sea, even there, your hand will lead me. He said, in your right hand will lay hold of me. If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me and the light around me will be night. He said, even the darkness is not dark to you. And the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. He says, for you formed my inward parts. All right. You wove me in my mother's womb. You mean, you mean even though my parents... Whoever they are, right? Sometimes we don't even know who they are. Come on, let's tell the truth. But God knew that you were being woven together. He was behind that. Okay? So he was behind that. And when he put us in there, okay, it's not just by happenstance that babies are made. Come on now. We got to understand the spiritual side of this here. We got to understand that God has a purpose or he wouldn't have released them into the earth. Come on. He said, you form my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. He said, I will give thanks to you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. And my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret. Hmm. And skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen my substance, my unformed substance. And he said, and in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me. When as yet there was not one of them. So God wrote a book about us. 
And guess what? In your book that he wrote before he put you in your mother's womb, he wrote about this day. We wouldn't be here if he didn't write it. He wrote about it. Okay? It's not by happenstance because in the Hebrew mind of God, God is Hebrew, right? In the Hebrew mind of God, there is no coincidence. Everything is intentional and on purpose. All right? And 17 says, how precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would outnumber the sand. When I wake, I am still with you. And so he says, God's thoughts were precious about him. <laughs> Why? Because God is love. Okay, we don't understand the depths of God's love because we try and figure out love in the natural and in the carnal mind. Supernatural love is not like our love. It ain't nothing like it. Okay, because our carnal love is conditional. You do something nice for me, I'll do something nice for you, right? It's, it's, not, about, it's not like God's love. When he sacrificed and he gave and he did all of that and we didn't even love God. He died for us, right, before we, were even, we even knew who he was. That's some deep love right there. He was punished for our sin. That's love. And he didn't do nothing wrong, nothing to deserve what he did, but God sent Jesus because of love. Okay, and so he didn't just send him to save you from hell. That's great and that's awesome. That's, that's the beginning, but he sent he sent Jesus so we could receive him, so we could be in fellowship with him and, and do our purpose in the earth. It all goes back to that salvation. When we get saved, that's the beginning. That's just the beginning, and now God has to cleanse us. He has to get all this stuff out of us, and that's what these, these kind of meetings are about. It's getting rid of all the things that's hindering us from our purpose and our destiny. Amen? Blockers and things, wrong thinking and all of those things. It can be sicknesses. It can be diseases. It can be many, many, many things that hinder us. And so God wrote a book about you. And so Proverbs 19.21 says, Many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. Isn't that good news? And God is a patient God. So we have to understand that what we are fighting in this earth realm, we, I call them, as I was hearing it today on the way here, we're fighting bloodline wars. That's what we're fighting. We're in a war with our bloodline. It's the truth. That's because, I mean, I know I have a spirit. I know he's in me. We get born again. His spirit comes in us. He promises us a new life. And so we have a new life. We've been born again by the spirit. So we're connected one to the father in our spirit. And so now the Holy Spirit has to work through our carnal thinking. You know, he has to work through some things in our mind that are wrong. Wrong thoughts, the rejection and the fear and the abandonment and how we were conceived and these legal rights of the enemy. And that's what these cleansings do because we do the repentance and we come out of agreement with the lies of the enemy. And it breaks these legal rights of the enemy. And so demons have to go. Assignments have to go. Contracts have to go. Right? All of those things have to go because Jesus defeated everything on the cross. John 10.10 10 says, the thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. He said, but I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. So abundant life, is, it's more than just a saved life. It's a healed life. It's a life of peace. And so Jesus, when he died, he, his whole body was pierced and there was bleeding and there was bruising. And everything that took place on the cross from the head all the way down to our toes, it was paid for. Everything that we suffer with, every disease, every sickness, come on, every, every lie of the enemy, everything. Everything we were born into, Jesus defeated on a cross. So you look at the church today and you say, well, how come we ain't live an abundant life? How come we still hate each other? Come on. How come we still fight? How come there's divisions? How come we, we can't love right? All of those things, you know, how come, how come we're still uh, slipping and dipping and diving and all these things that we do when Jesus defeated that stuff? Okay. And so Romans 7, let's go there. There's two natures in us. Oh, Jesus. See, Paul understood. 
You mean Apostle Paul wrestled with stuff? Oh, yes, he did. Yes, he did. See, Jesus wrestled in the garden, but guess what? He won. There ain't no sin in Jesus. He couldn't have died for us on the cross perfect so we could be redeemed if he sinned. He never sinned ever. So he wrestled and it, with himself in the garden. When he sweat these drops of blood, that's a real thing. You know, that really did happen. That's not a fairy tale. That can happen. It's proven that can happen to people in agony and anguish. But he went to the cross. He did what he was supposed to do so we could all come out. He showed us you can have victory here. Because I, I, I paid the price for you so you can be free. So Romans 7, let's go there. Paul's talking about these two natures in him. The conflict of two natures in verse uh, 14. He says, for we know that the law is spiritual. He says, but I am of flesh sold into bondage of, to sin. He says, for what I am doing, I do not understand. For I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing I hate. Now, that's a warfare right there. That He's talking about spiritual warfare there. He knows better. He knows he shouldn't do some things. He knows he shouldn't have those kind of thoughts. He said, but man, I'm wrestling. I'm, I'm doing things that I hate. That's pretty hard words right there. And some of us understand what he's talking about. You know, when we have those evil thoughts and we know better. You know, or it could be anything. It could be some kind of vice, something. He says in 16, but if I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. So now, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. Hmm. All right. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is, look, in my flesh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's not talking about his spirit because that's holy. So when we're saved, the Holy Spirit is in there. Down inside our belly somewhere is our spirit man. I don't know all that, but I know he's in there. Okay, we can't figure that out, but he's in there. We can feel him right now in our spirit. <laughs> we were sealed by the spirit of God. So you got like two people in there. Come on. You got the spirit man that's full of power. The spirit man that has every promise and every blessing. Then you got this old flesh man. And that's your, that's your war going on. You got two wars going on. And you got a warfare in there. Conflict of two natures. He says, so now no longer am I the one doing it, but the sin which is in me. He says, for the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. So that means that when you're saved, you always have in you good, a willingness to do good. You always have the Holy Spirit desiring you yeah. to do right. Yeah. Praise God for that. Yeah. Okay. He convicts us when we sin. Yeah. We know that. You say Christian sins. Yeah, it's called acts of unrighteousness. It's still sin. Yeah. <laughs> and so he, he convicts us. Okay. Because they used to say, well, you're, you're, not a, you're not a sinner anymore. No, we're not. We're a saint. But we still do acts of unrighteousness now. Come on now. Paul was one of the greatest apostles that planted all these churches. And he's talking about, look, I got two natures in me. How can he say that when he did all these things? This is the same man that went up into heaven. He said, in the body, out of the body, I don't know. Remember that story? He said, but I don't, I don't even know. He said, I can't even write down what I saw. It's indescribable. And, I, and not only that, but he said, I'm not allowed to tell you. God won't let me. Wow. But yet he says, I have a conflict in me. Come on now. We got to humble ourselves here. We're, we're made of flesh, but we have a spirit. Hallelujah. And so he says, for the good I want to do, I do not do, but I practice a very evil that I don't want. He says in verse 20, but if I am doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin that was, is, dwells in me. He says, I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, not in his flesh, because his flesh don't like the law. The flesh wants to lie. Come on. The flesh wants to cheat. The flesh wants to steal. The flesh wants to get into sexual sin. Come on. The flesh, man. 
He said, but the inner man agrees with God. Your spirit is in agreement with God. He said, but I see a different law in my members of my body waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. He said, wretched man that I am. He said, who will set me free from the body of this death? Now look what he says. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. <laughs> That's good news. He says, so then on the one hand, I myself, he said, with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other with my flesh, the law of sin. So he says, Jesus would rescue him from those things. And that's what Jesus did in Colossians. He defeated everything that we battle in our flesh. He defeated poverty. He defeated lack. Mm -hmm. He defeated all those generational whoredom and addictions and bondages that's been passed down. He defeated all that witchcraft that that our ancestors did that we don't even know. I'm here, I'm here to tell you, he defeated all that. Many times people, when they get pulled into, into addictions, it's because somewhere in their DNA is some witchcraft working. Because sorcery and pharmacia, yeah. all of those things is witchcraft. It is. It's a, different, it's a different face than what, see, in the church, in a religious church, we say witchcraft. We think maybe a, you know, an occult shop, maybe, or maybe some new age stuff, or, you know, or we think about the little fairy tale books, you know, the witches with the hats and all that stuff. No. Witchcraft works in a lot of ways. It has a lot of different faces to it, but it's still the same spirit. But it, it knows, it's a, it's a familiar spirit, so it knows how to come down the family line, and it knows how to lure every generation into something. But it's still the same spirit, okay? But it comes from back there somewhere. Somewhere. We don't know where, but God knows where. That's what I love. So, bloodline battles. Jesus said we must, what? Choose life. And so, bondage wants to choose for us. Jesus said that we have a choice every day to choose life or death, right? And so in our inner man, like I was reading from Paul, our inner man says, life. You know? And the flesh will say, you're rejected, you're no good, you're a failure. But the inner man says, no, you've been redeemed. You're a son. You can do all things through Christ. So you have this conflict going on on the inside of you, right? Y'all know what I'm talking about. Well, sometimes these conflicts are because there's demons of bondage that are residing inside of us. There's some doors and some things that have been open. And those voices that we hear, it's not just in the atmosphere, it's in us. It's in our heart. Because Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. And he says, what comes out of the heart are evil things, adulteries and fornications. And he lists all these things that come out of our heart, right? And so bondage wants to choose for you. It doesn't want you choosing life. Okay. It's been defeated on the cross and every spirit of bondage knows that. It says everybody's bondage is different. It could be a bondage to, um, let's, let's be honest. It could be, um, bondage to sugar, caffeine. Come on. It could be a bondage to nicotine. It could be a bondage to pornography. It could be a bondage to um, anything that takes a hold of my will and makes me serve him. Mm -hmm. Hate. We don't want to hate, but sometimes there's certain people we hate. Okay, why? Because probably they did us somebody in maybe that culture or Somebody from the past. Some of these things are passed down. It's called racism. Come on. It's called racism and prejudices. Preconceived judgments and ideas about people. Because somebody told us something. Somebody passed down some offenses. Somebody handed down some wrong thinking about people that God never, God never intended for the children to know those things. You know, a child just, a child has to learn hate. And I know sometimes they're born into some, some stubbornness and some pride. But I'm here to tell you, Jesus said, unless you become like a child and you humble yourself, right? Like a little child, you can't inherit the kingdom of heaven. You can take, 
a bunch of little children and put them together in a room. And even if they have a schism, in two, three minutes, they're playing again. You know, they done forgot about what they were upset about. You know, and it's true. Children, are, they forgive quickly. A child can be abused by the mother or the, or the father, whatever. And I'm telling you, the next day when they wake up, they still loving on their mama. It's true. So God's trying to teach us something here. So bondage wants to choose for you. And so because of the lack of knowledge, okay, the Bible says that God's people perish. And so many people perish in bondages because they don't know they can be free. Yeah. It's so true. Many people sitting in churches, you look at the statistics today and you will see so many preachers that commit suicide. Yeah, so That's awful. Pastors that are overwhelmed with the anxiety of the church and the people, you know, and they're overwhelmed. Situations happen. Offenses come. People get broken and hurt in church. And we, many times, we put uh, pastors and leaders up like God, yes. you know, and then they fail. Something happens, and then we just fail too. Yes. That shouldn't be like that. They're people too. They have needs. They have their person. And so people perish for lack of knowledge, okay? And so they don't know that the enemy has been defeated, and so people will stay bound by the enemy. And what happens is those are like familiar spirits. We get used to the enemy. We get used to being in suffering. Come on. We get used to being pulled that way and just giving in to that spirit. We know, you know, he tells us you're going to cycle in just a few days. You already know. Go ahead and get high. You know you're going to cycle. Come on, that's how he talks to you. That's bondage. You have to understand that a spirit of bondage talks to you in first person. It's true. He'll say, I want, I need, I desire. You think, well, that's my thoughts. No, that's that spirit in there. That's the spirit. I want. Mm -hmm. I'm craving. It's true. Bondage talks to you in first person. Mm -hmm. And it's and you know it's bondage because it pulls you into death. It pulls you away from Jesus. It pulls you into things that's harmful for your body. It pulls you. Remember, the thief comes to what? Still kill and destroy your life. Okay, the Spirit of God will say, "You know, you don't need that." He'll say, "No, no, no! Don't, don't touch that. Don't taste that. Don't do that. There's no life in that. Stay away." You know, all those things. But I'm telling you, the spirit of bondage speaks to you in first person. So familiar spirits of bondage become our friends. Familiar means friendly. That means we get accustomed to that. We get used to the wrong thinking. We get accustomed to living beneath what God said we could have. We get accustomed to hearing, you're no good. We get accustomed to hearing, you'll never overcome that. We get accustomed. This is just the way I am. These are some of the things that bondage will say. They'll say things like, this is just how it is. Mm -hmm. Familiar spirit. It's just how it is. Say things like, this is how it's always been. This is how it'll always be. Liar. The devil is a liar. Because the Bible says all things are possible with God. Mm -hmm. But we haven't taught in church about what the process that it takes sometimes. It takes a process. And so we have to walk out this process and begin to eliminate and, and cut away these things that are hindering us and binding us. Get delivered. Come on. Get set free. And then get the word in there of truth and begin to stand and begin to work the word. We've got to work the word. And another thing, and I used to say this, I even bought the plaque. Tell the truth. It is what it is. The Lord said, you need to stop saying that. You better get rid of that plaque. A little, you know, those little things you stick on the shelf. It is what it is. Where's faith in that? There's no faith in that. That means I'm settling for how it is. I'm settling for less. I'm settling that things will always be as they are. Where is faith in that? It's not in there. That's my soul carnal man. Whoever made those little plaques, that's where, how they live. But I don't have to live like that. Amen. So there's always bloodline 
battles is what they're called. So you can write that on your paper, bloodline battles. What is your bloodline battle? What is it? I'm still working out some myself. It's true. Oh, yeah. Some things that have been passed down to you, bloodline battles. The real. You remember the story of um, Abraham and Isaac. I'll just write these chapters down. I'm not going to go there for the sake of time tonight. But Gen- Genesis 20, 1 through 7, when Abraham lies about Sarah being his wife. So that's my sister. God had to show up to the king. Say, you better let that woman go or you're going to die. You know, and, and the king was terrified. Right? Well, guess what? Six more chapters later, you see Isaac doing the same thing with Rebecca. That's a bloodline battle right there. Lied. She's my sister. The king, the same thing. He takes her. He didn't touch her either. Look at the mercy of God, right? But when you see this, they both lie out of fear. All the things that God did in their life. And they have to lie that that's their wife. So you think about these things. That's a battle right there. You will see cycles and patterns in God's people in the old covenant. God will show you these things that, that they did. They fell into it's the same cycle, the same pattern as their fathers. And you'll see it when you read in the Kings, the books of Kings. It'll tell you that it'll say, you know, say King Asa did just what his father did. And he, they quote the father, but it's like four generations. It's way back. But they continue to do the same thing. Bloodline battle. It's been passed down. Come on now. Got to think about that. Genesis chapter 4. You remember when Cain kills Abel. We're going to go somewhere here in a minute. Let's go there. Genesis 4. But you'll see all these things in the Bible. Thank God for Jesus. See, God sent him to fix all that stuff. So we don't have to keep doing, repeating these things. Genesis 4, verse 1, it says, Now the man had relations with his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. And she said, I have gotten a man child with the help of the Lord. Again, she gave birth to his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of the flocks. But Cain was a tiller of the ground. So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. Abel, on his part, also brought the firstlings of his flock and their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offerings. But for Cain and for his offering, he had no regard. So Cain became very angry and his countenance fell. And the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why is your countenance falling? If you do well, will you, he says, will not your countenance be lifted up? He says, if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you, but you must master it. The same thing today. Cain told Abel's brother, and it came about when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel's brother and he kills him. Then the Lord says to Cain, where is Abel your brother? And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? He said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. He says, now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you cultivate the ground, it will no longer yield its strength to you. And you will be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth. And so Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is too great to bear. And so he says, behold, you have driven me this day from the face of the ground. Remember, he was a what? A tiller of the ground. And from your face, I will be hidden and I will be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth. And whoever finds me will kill me. So the Lord said to him, therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance will be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord appointed a sign for Cain so that no one finding him would slay him. And so then we Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and he settled in the land of not east of Eden. And if you read his story, he did not build a good city. Come on now away from the presence of the Lord. And so the bloodline battles with this, you see the rejection and the jealousy and the envy that was in the boy. Okay. Against his brother. And you remember, he said, you must master it because it's crouching at the door and it's going to have you. 
And it's so true. Unless we deal with those things, they come in and they traffic our destiny. That was not God's hello, perfect plan for Cain. I'm here to tell you. But Cain made a choice to live with that. He made a choice to live with those things and to allow the enemy, which they were, it was the enemy, allow him, allow them to traffic him. And so that is a real deal right there. And so that's what the devil does. He wants to traffic us in these areas. So we have to pay attention to how we think. Sometimes what I find is that we get used to stinking thinking, don't we? Let's tell the truth. We get used to that sometimes. We get used to negative thoughts. We get used to uh, the devil trafficking us. I, I say that he, he traffics us. Mm -hmm. We get used to these irritants and these things, and what you tolerate will never change. Okay? So if you just tolerate the enemy bullying you and, and picking on you and trafficking you and talking down to you, he will never shut up. Okay? It ain't going to happen. He will continue to do so. So God speaks to his people just like he did all the way back, all the way back in Genesis. He said, hey, why is your countenance low? Why do you feel this way? So he was, he was reaching out to him, trying to warn him that sin was at the door. Mm -hmm. But he didn't make him obey God, obey him, did he? He gave him a choice. <laughs> and so God gives us choices. You know, we can, we can live our whole life as a believer outside of the will of God. Help us, Lord. And you say, well, how do you do that? Because you've made your own path. You know, the broad path. The narrow path is the path of Christ, right? And it's different for all of us in here. So God is the righteous judge. But I'm telling you, many people leave the earth before I believe. And people can argue, but this is my opinion. Many people sometimes leave the, leave the earth before their time because of foolishness, because of not taking care of their bodies or all of those kind of things, ignoring the voice of God when he's speaking to you about things and you just keep ignoring God. And, and I'm telling you, the devil will have his way. And he does that. Or because people, the church has not been obedient to teach deliverance. How many people kill themselves in church? Suicide rates. Depression, addictions, and bondages, and there's no deliverer. There's a scripture in Psalms, and I don't have it referenced here, but there's a scripture in Psalms that talks about how when there's no deliverance, the lion will tear them. This is, remember, the enemy can roam around like what? A roaring lion seek, seeking someone to devour. And so if there is not a deliverer, guess what? People aren't going to get set free. God works through people. It's very important. That's why Jesus said the believers, and he said, my disciples are going to cast out demons. They're going to have to cast out demons and heal the sick and all of those things because I put my spirit in them, and I'm requiring these things out of them because the world needs me. You see, the world needs Jesus. We say that they need all of him. They need all of Jesus. Amen. So let's talk about this because Cain was battling rejection here. And you'll see that. You'll see the spirit of rejection just woven all throughout. And so rejection brings a false identity to you. Okay. And rejection comes through society. You know, we work a lot with the Native Americans. You talk about a rejected people. Okay. But God is raising them up. We had a powerful encounter. And he's healing them and empowering them. And they're just, they're rising up. Praise the Lord, right? The last shall be first. And you will see a great move coming out of there. And so rejection brings a false identity. So you have to understand who you are in Christ. Okay. And, and you receive the sonship through adoption as a son. When you get born again, you're adopted into the family. So you're not a stepchild. Come on. You're a favorite child because you got born again. You got saved. So you're God's favorite child. <laughs> but how many people really believe it? How many people can climb up on Abba's lap and know, hey, that's my papa. That's my Abba. That's my daddy right there. 
But it's true when we don't have a right image. And when we've been, you know, beat down and we have all these things going on or we've been born into certain families. So there's areas of rejection here you have to look at. You have to look at certain things to see what it is that's keeping you from receiving the fullness of what God has for you. And so when when people have this sonship in place and they really understand, and I'm here to tell you, I didn't get that at first. I've been saved a long time, but I didn't really understand sonship. Till I began to grow in the things of the spirit and God began to heal and peel off things and deliver me and, and free me of these wrong mindsets. Okay. And when that began to happen, I began to get healed in my heart. My heart had to be healed. My soul had to be healed from all that, all those traumas and rejections and all of those things that word curses, come on, all those open doors. God had to come in and sweep that stuff out and clean that stuff out of me. So my whole heart could be filled with God's spirit come on because your spirit your whole your spirit man is fully filled with the Holy Ghost <laughs> hallelujah <laughs> you have a full spirit man in there there's not a junior there's not a one quarter well I just got a quarter of the Holy Ghost that sounds funny right you may act like you got a quarter but you really have the fullness of the Holy Spirit it's just your soul man is not full of God yet in areas because you still have fears. You still have rejections. You still have a bunch of anger in there. And so we have to love the Lord to God with all of our heart. I give him a piece over here, but he's not getting this piece. Well, you don't have the fullness. You, you got to get the fullness. We need the fullness today. Amen. He needs all of us. And so. God will reveal in you his plan and his purpose when you really know who you are. That's why Romans 12, 1 tells us that, right? We, we can't be conformed to the world. We got to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. But I'm here to tell you to renew a mind. You say if you have a mind that's full of rejection, you want to, you're trying to get that mind. You got to get that spirit out of there. Because you're going to have these, you're going to have this war going on. These two natures going on inside your head, inside your heart. And so it's really difficult for, for you to be conformed as a son when you feel so beat down and rejected. Low self-esteem and unworthiness, insecurities, all these things, God delivers us out of these. And so rejection will cause you to create your own identity. Okay, and it's out of the fear of rejection Okay, the fear of being rejected, all of that works together. Rejection, the fear of rejection, and self-rejection all works together in the stronghold of rejection. If you have a rejected soul, you will have the fear of being rejected wherever you go. God will be speaking to you. I want you to do something. I want you to, you know, I've got something for you to do. Well, they ain't going to receive me. They ain't going to gonna listen to what I have to say. They, they, you know, all, you know, I don't have nothing good to say. I mean, all these things will just begin to talk to you. Mm -hmm. If God sent you, then he qualified you and he will equip you to do it. <laughs> okay. Because it's by his spirit you do these things. But, but rejection will always talk you out of fulfilling the call of God on your life. And so false identity spiritually is psychological, believe it or not, right? Because that's where the spirits dwell, because in your soul is your bloodline, okay? It is your DNA. Who you are today is because of what you've been born into and what's inside of you. Life of the flesh is in the blood. Mm -hmm. That's why you look like your parents. And there's certain, you know, you have certain characteristics. Not everything is bad, but there's some things that get passed down to us that we don't need and we don't desire, Okay. And so it comes out of that, out of the soul realm. And so it, and it can cause a lot of confusion, a lot of things um, that can come from this, this false identity. And so when we try to take on the mind of Christ Jesus and learn of him, okay, we have to do that. We got to take on the mind of Christ. So Jesus says, you got to deny yourself, right? Take up your cross and follow me. And so denying ourself means that there's some things we've learned that is not the will of God for us. There are some things that have been passed down, some mindsets 
you, you, you know, and so we look at the areas of cultural traditions, okay? We see that a lot because we go into different uh, cultures, and so there's cultural traditions that have been passed down in cultures that is not the mind of God. It is not the mind of the Spirit. It is, it is a cultural mindset. Mm -hmm. Some cultures, women aren't allowed to speak. It's true. Come on now. Sometimes they're beat down. That's wrong. And so that, that what does that do to them? Women uh, uh, causes a rejected soul. They're, they're chained up in bondage, right? And so that's an area, cultural traditions. That's just one example, but there's many things that get passed down. Your biological families, they play, pr play a huge role in who you are today. It's true. And it's, that's one of the hardest things because familiar spirits are passed down in family generational lines. And so a familiar spirit is a household servant of the enemy. Okay, that's what it is. It's Latin for household servant. That means that Satan has familiar spirits, okay, generational demons in every family that are assigned to stay in that family and to keep that family from the fullness of their purpose and their destiny that God intended them to walk in. Every family has a destiny. Every family has a redemptive purpose in Christ. Every family. We're all different. And then, of course, we come together as the family of God. And so even in our natural families, I'm telling you, I feel the Holy Ghost so strong. It is so true that every, you know, you know how in the world they have these, the, the clans, right? They, you know, you're from the, like we're from the Cano, Mary George, so the Cano clan. And then you have the, the Adams clan and all of that. But you go all the way back, you know, you'll find in the world, that, you know, the coat of arms and different things that they were strong in. Hmm. Different things that, that, you know, even in the natural, you can see some of these gifts and these talents and these abilities, okay? So when we come into Christ, you know, we come in through the Spirit of God. God uses these things and just expands them. And he uses them for his glory and for his purpose. And so the devil comes to pull us out of the plan of God through the unredeemed part of them. Is true. The unredeemed part. And so sometimes you can look and you can see in this family, maybe there's a lot of, say, drug dealing or something. It's just generation, just, just broken drug dealing. Could it be that they have a gift of entrepreneurship? <laughs> Could it be? That they have a gift to make money and to create wealth for the kingdom. But the enemy pulls them over here because there's unredeemed. There's an unredeemed um, part of their DNA that the devil says, oh, we got to get them now. We got to get them now. We got to get them addicted to things. We got to get them out of the will and the purpose of God. Because if they really step into who they are. They're going to create some wealth for the kingdom. So you got to think, you got to think bigger. You know, you can't see people, you can't see them in their bondage as that's who they are. Okay. Because the bondage is not really who they are. The bondage comes from Satan, but God formed them and put them in their mother's womb with a purpose. And that purpose is good. It's a good purpose. So what happened that they went the wrong way. It's those bloodline battles that's in them. I'm telling you, it's real. It's the bloodline battles. And so, biological families, that's a huge area of rejection and strongholds, generational iniquities. We just that's what that what is what I just spoke to you is an iniquity in the bloodline. Something that needs to be uprooted, blotted out. Life experiences is another area. If you've been through life experiences or traumas or abuse and suffering and you've never been healed, that is a gaping, bloody wound. And it's, it's toxic and it's infested and demons are attracted to wounds. 
That's how, that's how people, that's how those demons root down so deep into people, you know, and they get fractured even in their mind, and you see that. And so people continue in deeper darkness, and then more demons come in the wound. It's kind of like, and it's a gross analogy, but it's true. It's kind of like flies and maggots. What do they go to? They go to sores. They go to something that's dead. Look at something laying on the road. It's, it's just, that's what demons do because Jesus says that the vultures gather to the carcass, to the death. And so where the carcass is, the vultures come. He's talking about spirits. Demons don't go to light. They go to darkness and death because that's their assignment. That's who they are. You know, they, they're attracted to dark things. That's how you can, you know that when you go into certain places, it's dark up in there and there's a lot of stuff going on and a lot of spiritual activity. They're not, you know, they go to dark places. Amen. And so life experiences causes that religious beliefs. That's another area. A lot of people in churches, a lot of religious spirits, they're mean. Let's tell the truth. They're mean. They're nasty. (laughs) They're the ones that came after Jesus. Come on. They killed him. And it was permitted, but still. They always came after the the pure love of Christ, the liberty of Christ, his authority, his liberty. All that he did, they didn't like it. Religious beliefs. Word curses and trauma. That's another area there. We're talking about um, how you can get a rejected bad self-image and a false identity. It comes from these areas, areas of rejection, cultural traditions, biological families, generational iniquities, life experiences, religious beliefs, word curses, and trauma. Those are your areas where you can have a false identity. There's a lot of preachers and pulpits that have an identity as being a preacher. Take the pulpit away, they would probably die. Their whole, their whole identity is preaching. And preaching loud and preaching good. Come on. Nothing wrong with good preaching. But you hear me by the spirit what I'm saying. It's like they form the identity in that. Instead of in Christ. Okay. And everything. And if someone rejects them and doesn't let them come in to preaching again. Depression comes. All this stuff comes in them. all, All these terrible things happen. Because they don't know who they are in Christ. Okay. Because you will suffer betrayal in church. Hate to tell you that. You will suffer betrayal and you will suffer rejection in church. Come on. And so, thank God that we can evaluate these areas. And another, another thing that, that keeps a spirit of rejection is a victim mentality. Okay? Because life has been difficult for you and you've not been healed yet. And you can take on a victim mentality. Where this victim mindset gets in you, okay, in your heart, in your mind, and you continue to cycle as a victim. Victims, all perpetrators will always find a victim. It's going to happen. They, they, in the spirit realm, that's what happens. They will find you and it'll continue to cause the victim to cycle back into the same thing, the same cycles of activity. Come on. False identities. So the false identities of limitations and restrictions that life has created in in you can be worn down or torn down, I mean, by the word of God. Because a greater one lives in you. But you have to, we have to begin to teach people what the, the wrong ways of thinking. You know, the victim mindset, everything that's connected to that, all of those things that come in. Because I'm telling you, the Bible says, so man thinks in his heart, so is he. Everybody in this room, we are where we are because of the way we have thought. And our thoughts steer uh, the course of our life. So that's why if we have good thoughts in Christ and we have the word in us and we meditate. Remember he told Joshua, you meditate on this word, on this law, you will have good success. Because you got to meditate on that. You can meditate on Joshua. You meditate on my words and you will prosper. You will have success. 
But if we've not heard the word and we don't know the word and we've never experienced the freedom and the liberty from the bondage of these things, it's going to be very difficult. Okay, so we want to make disciples of Jesus. And so in order to do that, people have to be free, y'all. And we have to continue to grow as a child of God in this area. And so from the acts of abandonment, because abandonment and rejection, many people are abandoned. I think about Gideon, you know, in, in Judges of chapter 6, when Gideon, even though God used him, but if you read about it, Gideon was full of rejection, insecurity, and fear. When God came to him, sends an angel at everything to Gideon, he was full of excuses why he could not deliver God's people. That was something in his thinking that was wrong. Okay, it was, it was not God. God kept talking to him. So it, it says in verse 15 of chapter 6 of Judges, he said, in, um, the angel of the Lord says to him, he said, Gideon speaks and says, Oh Lord, how shall I deliver Israel? He said, Behold, now look here, we're talking about family issues, right? He said, My family, hmm. My family is the least of Manasseh, he said, and I am the youngest in my father's house. And so you see that example of what he was saying. He said of a false identity that was woven into Gideon due to his family rejection and poverty. God chose him and pointed him out, and he's making excuses to the angel of the Lord and said, I'm the least. He said, I'm the poorest and I'm the least. I can't do anything. You know, and God continued to speak to him. The rich young ruler is another good example. He had a wrong, even though he had all that wealth, right? The rich young ruler could have left and followed Jesus in Matthew 19, but his identity, his false identity, okay, of success was in his wealth. You see that? So high or low, it don't matter. Our identity is Christ. It's Christ in me, the hope of glory. That's how I can do what I do. But if you don't know you're a son in, in God, the enemy will pull you and you'll get your identity and all these other things. And I'm telling you what, it'll have to come down to be a follower of Christ. And so Jesus was calling this rich young ruler to follow him and become a disciple. But instead, it says in verse 22, but when the young man heard his, this statement, he went away grieving for he was one who owned much property. And so Jesus said, look, you, the reason why Jesus had to, had to say that to him was because he was idolatrous. He had, his idol was his stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, his idol was his stuff. That's why Jesus, you don't see him telling people to do that, but he told him, he said, hey, go sell all your stuff and give to the poor. Come follow me. Because he knew that all his stuff had his affection. You see, all of those things. That's a false identity right there. He messed up there. So from the, and so let's talk about this abandonment. From the acts of abandonment comes in the spirit of rejection. I find that abandonment and rejection work together. It means to be forsaken or deserted. So these spirits can be interwoven together at the root, usually generationally working with rejection. And so the act of abandonment is a root issue that will cause us to feel like an orphan. Orphan spirits real in churches. It's out in the world, but I'm telling you, it's here. The spirit of illegitimacy. Religion makes us earn it. We have to earn everything. We have to earn everything, and we'll never measure up. See, that's wrong, too. That's a wrong. That's wrong. We're, we, we accept Christ. We're in Christ, and we walk with him, and he changes me. Okay? He, you can't change yourself. That's where people get in trouble. That's why they, they fail, because they don't allow the Spirit of God to work. Amen? And so many children raised outside of a home of biological parents... Okay, abandonment, they feel rejected, are common issues we are facing in the church today. And so many absent fathers, absent mothers, you know, all those things. And there's things that happen, and we've seen it, you know, when the, they were out in the world, and maybe they've lost their children. But guess what? I've seen God restore many back to their parents. Okay, so there is a process. 
Okay. People say, I want it right now. You didn't get there right now. It, you, there was some things, there was some choices, but God, as you, as you submit and you yield to him, you let him heal you, you know, and God can restore, restore. That's one of the names of God is he's a restoring God. <laughs> he's a restore of the breaches. That's a breach. That wasn't God's intention. It was not God's best. Of course not. But the enemy came in for whatever reason. He came in. He began to traffic and he began to lure. And he, he come, remember, he's the thief. He wants to steal your health. He wants to steal your family. He wants to steal everything. Okay. Your life. And so some acts of abandonment having been sometimes adopted. People struggle with that until they settle it in their heart that God has adopted them. Okay. It's very true. We, we work with people having been adopted, having been left by a parent or a guardian, um, having been left to raise yourself as a child. These are some acts of abandonment that children can feel. Going through a bad divorce or breakup. Here's an adult. A bad divorce or a breakup. Feel abandoned. Um, all your dreams are shattered. And even sometimes thoughts that the Lord has left you, especially when you go through crisis. Why did I have to go through that crisis? Where were you, God? Come on now. We've all probably been through some of those things. Where were you? Okay, so the spirit, that spirit of abandonment will come in. Okay, he comes in and he begins to set up and continues to speak to us and talk to us because we haven't learned that it's the enemy and how to cast him down yet. We haven't learned that and that God's love is perfect through me. And when I go through a crisis, he's there to pick me up and to carry me through the fire. I don't die in it. Amen. Amen. Being constantly ignored by those you love. Betrayed by spiritual leaders. Mm. Abandonment. So abandonment is an act. Okay. Whether it's perceived or real. Because sometimes people feel they it's perceived abandonment. You know, the parent did not abandon the child, but the parent had to work. Or there wouldn't be anything to eat. Come on. And so the child was left maybe with, you know, a sitter a lot or left here or left there. And the child's feeling like, right, my parents abandoned me. They just leave me here. They don't understand the depths of things. And so it takes, it takes a, uh, if you're a believing parent, there's a way God will show you how to pray over them and how to reinforce that you, that you love them. But sometimes, you know, parents are broken. Let's tell the truth. Parents are broken, so we do the best we can, you know, with what we know, with the tools we have, and we don't always have the right tools. That's why Titus 2 is so important, that ministry of Titus 2, where the older tell the younger, the older teach the younger. Come on now. We need that today really bad. We need it. We need healthy people that have been through some stuff and been healed that can impart to younger people. There's a lot of single parents today that need encouragement. I'm here to tell you. And so those are acts, right? And then we have the feeling of rejection. So abandonment is an act. Rejection is a feeling, feeling that you don't belong or ever fit in. Come on now. We tell the truth. Every one of us in this room has had these kind of thoughts. Feeling you are worthless and of no value. Always accusing yourself. Thank God for healing, right? Feelings of failure. Uselessness and being invisible to other people. Rejection will cause you to feel invisible. Believe it, it's real. And it's like when everybody's in the room, people be talking. That spirit, well, you know you're invisible. They ain't going to talk to you. You know, they can't see you over here. I'm telling you, that's a demonic spirit of rejection right there. Feelings of not being loved, accepted, or able to have any friends. Some people have believe the lie. Oh, I can't have friends. It's true. Nobody, nobody ever wants to be my friend. You know, I'm just wired a certain kind of way. And I'm telling you, God made us relational. We're to have covenant relationships and friendships. Come on now. He didn't, he didn't tell any, anybody in the Bible, even if they separated themselves to be with God, they came back to people. They always came back. Jesus is our example of that. So feelings that you are not important, nor are your needs. This is all rejection. Feelings of never being good enough. Mm -hmm. 
fearing man. And then you have being a perfectionist. That's kind of odd, huh? No, it's not. I'm telling you, rejection will make you try and be perfect. It will wear you out. Got to be perfect. A perfectionist. Everything has to be perfect. Or, and as soon as everything is not perfect the way you want it, you just, you, it just beats you up, right? That's rejection right there. Driven to performance mode to be loved or to be measured up to other standards. That's a big one right there. I always had to watch that one because when you grow up and everything that you do as a child is not good enough <laughs> and you can't please anybody, so you work overtime to perform and to do everything just right and to work really hard. If I work really hard, they'll receive me. If I work really hard, I might do a good enough job to get a pat on the back or something. You know, <laughs> some of you laughing because you know it's true. It's rejection. It's trying to make us, and we do this with God. If I'm just good enough, if I just preach good enough or teach good enough or, you know, if I, if I can just hear God better, he'll love me more. He loves you already. He loved you before you even knew him. Okay? And you, you need to hear this, some of you, that you can't be any better than you are right now to make God love you more. If you never prophesied, he loves you the same. It's true, isn't it? If you never lay hands on somebody he loves you the same see and it's hard for us it hurts our mind to think like that does mine but it hurts our minds to think like that that god loves me perfectly because he said that god is love and sometimes we look at people's lives and we think god must really love them because they really got it going on now, when I'm an obedient child of God, there's a favor that comes with me, okay? But the love for me, the love God has for me is the same when I'm obedient or disobedient. That's hard to grasp because it said that he loved me before I knew him. So you, you understand what I'm saying? It's true. It's hard, to, it's hard to grasp that in our natural human understanding. But we can't, but the love of God can only be understood by the Spirit. All of, all of God's, all the spiritual things are understood spiritually. All right? And so we obey God because we want to keep out the traffic of Satan. And, and to know God, when you know him, you love him. I'm just here to tell you. The more you know Jesus, the more you love him. And the more you love him, the more it's, it's just not even a burden to deny yourself. When you first, when you first come into the things of, of the Lord, when you first learn about Jesus, sometimes things are like, it's like the three D's. Sometimes it's a duty. You mean I can't go over there no more? Man, you know, it's kind of like your own natural kids. You know, it's a duty. It's hard. But then... You keep obeying in that area, even though it's hard for you. And then you begin to discipline your body. Paul talks about you discipline yourself. You make it obey, right? And then you get to the next one, which is awesome. It's a delight. You don't even miss that stuff anymore. You don't even think about that stuff anymore because you're caught up in the intimacy and the presence of Jesus. Okay? You love him, and, and the favor of God will just flow through your life. Okay? So that's, that's how you, you, you understand what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that this rejection came in through this bloodline stuff, okay? It came in through there. And so rejection has a network. And we're going to pause so we can have a break and then we'll teach some more. But rejection in Mark 5, 8 through 9 says, For he had been saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And he was asking him, this is in Mark 5, when Jesus meets the demoniac, he had all those demons in him. He said, what is your name? And the man says, my name is Legion, for we are many. And so what you have to understand that rejection, like I said, there's three parts, but people can have rejection from their parents, rejection from society, rejection, come on, from um, your spouse, rejection from your children, 
Re all kinds of places. Rejection at school when you were little. Mm -hmm. That teacher rejected you and bullied you and picked on you. It's true, it happens. Teachers sometimes single out kids because they got issues. It's so true. You know, and if your family maybe, and I saw this growing up, like if a, if a teacher had the parent and the parent was bad, a bad kid, you know, and then, the, you know, a process of time. I've seen it, that that teacher has the child. So that teacher just thinks that, oh, yeah, that, that kid's just like their parent. I mean, that stuff is real. They don't even give that child a chance. They done labeled him, and they done, they done, that, they always got that last name. So, you know, see, that comes from society. That's society rejection. And that gets in that child. Why am I picked on in class? That child gets angry. And here comes all, these, all this wrong thinking and mindset. And you could have been an older sibling, too. Mm -hmm. An older sibling did some things. And then here comes the next kid up. That's why middle kids have so many issues sometimes, too, is because they're, they're coming up underneath maybe a rebellious older sibling. And so they got to pay a price from their parents because of the rebellion that the older kid did. Okay, I, I, I know about these things. It's very real. And so, but all of that is rejection. So the spirit of rejection's root system produces a network of demonic traffic with the door of fear and pride. Okay, and we'll get into that in a minute. So you got the family root system, which is abuse, abandonment, pregnancy problems, curses from the womb. You have society, culture, peer roots. And these can also be physical differences, social statuses. Come on. People reject people if they don't, you know, they don't look a certain kind of way or, you know, wealth, uh, money. You know, you don't have money, so people don't want to be around you. I mean, you know, all these, the world system, the world system. But in the kingdom of God, that don't even matter. Because Jesus said that a man's life does not consist in the possessions that he has. The value of that man is, is, doesn't exist or it's not important to what he has. The value is much deeper to God than things, right? Thank God for that. And so it can be uh, authority figures, all those kind of things, profiling, you know, which are all, um, you know, rooted. It's all different areas. These are good examples of how this rejection root system gets in place in the heart, in your soul, your mind, your will, your emotions. And it can have multiple spirits coming out of fear or pride that will work within the heart or soul of a person. And so that is an example of how the root system works. Okay. Does that make sense? Anybody have any thoughts or questions on that? 